welcome back to the vlog. Really excited today, my friend Monica is here from San Diego, who I probably have not seen in shit, like maybe close to eight years, I would say. And she is into holistic medicine, acupuncture, and a whole lot of things that I am unfamiliar with. So we are going to be doing acupuncture on myself for the very first time to alleviate some stress and then to also help with my healing, essentially. Um, I'll have her tell you guys a lot more about it. I know nothing about acupuncture or holistic medicine for that matter, but I'm very intrigued and very interested in it. And Monica and I have both shared some hardships over the last couple months that we have reconnected on and we are going to be jumping down into the podcast studio to record my first episodes hosting someone else on my podcast. So going to be taking you guys downstairs to the podcast studio with me and give you a little sneak peek of the episode as well. So see you there. at you live from the podcast studio. I don't know why I felt cool saying it like that, but <laughs> <laughs> Monica and I are here. Wanted to show you guys this little podcast setup we have here to record. This is, Monica, have you done podcasts before? Mm -hmm. Okay, well I have not, but this, <laughs> this was my first time kind of dabbling into the podcast world as I think I might have talked about on the previous YouTube video, but it's been an experience to the least, but really exciting one. And we're really stoked to be bringing some new information to you guys and all of the fun stuff we have in store. So this is the little setup they have going on here, hooks straight up to the computer. And <laughs> we have been um, trying to be tech pros at getting all of these hooked up and it hasn't been too bad. So we'll see you guys on the other side. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> what was that? We're off to a great start. <laughs> <laughs> oh my okay, god. It's gonna be fine. We're fine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Keep our <in> conversation. <laughs> oh lord. Okay, great <laughs> blooper. <laughs> Well, I just wanted to take a second and introduce Monica and welcome you to the Fearless AF podcast. Super excited to have you here. This is our very first episode. So really <laughs> excited. Thanks for coming all the way down from San Diego. Yes, thanks for having me. Before we get started, I wanted to introduce Monica. I know I've told you a little bit about where she came from, who she is, who she is to me but I wanted to give her a chance to kind of tell you a little bit more about herself because she has a very different background than what I come from. And I find that super intriguing and interesting. So do you wanna go ahead and tell them a little bit about yourself? Yeah, so I'm actually a licensed acupuncturist in the state of California. And I guess that means a lot of things these days. <laughs> it does. <laughs> Technically, I do a really an old um, energy form of medicine that's started by Taoist monks back thousands of years ago. Um, but today, it's something I get credentialed in, especially in the state of California, I like to really pat on the credentials there and the board exams. But I'm licensed in that, so I get to help people with all types of health, internal health, mental health, physical health, and I absolutely love what I do. And so I really have to be mindful of a few different things. One. I have to be very versed in Western medicine because it's not a common health practice, although it is gaining a lot of um, just notoriety, I believe, because it is becoming more and more evidence-based, which is really important here in our culture and our society. And also, I work with different energy forms. So my partner at my practice, so I have a practice called Reiki City uh, with my best friend, Melly Aguayo. She's a, a amazing Reiki master. Shout out to Melly. Yeah, shout out to <laughs> Melly. And and there's a story there with all of us. So oh, yeah. we'll go into that in a little bit too. Um, but we have a, a beautiful practice. We work side by side in San Diego and we get to help people um, from 
with everything, emotional disorders, physical disorders, mental disorders, like I said before, and I do a lot of internal health, both using the tools of acupuncture and Chinese medicinal herbs, diet, lifestyle, and we do a lot of um, mental, emotional health too, which has been so big in COVID. And a huge reason why I think we've come together uh, to talk about this topic today because, you know, it's if I hadn't been exposed to the background I have, I'd probably be in a very different place dealing with the things I'm dealing with right now and and trying to move through my life. (laughs) Right. And I find that so interesting, too, because during COVID, I mean, we all know that I already come from a very different background than you, and I am not well versed in medicine or anything on that front. But with my online coaching, I do work with women one-on-one. And during COVID, my biggest realization was that girls were experiencing a lot of mental health problems as, as well. And although they came to me for nutritional and fitness advice and guidance, what they were struggling most with was getting their mindset right and getting out of depressions that they were falling into out of nowhere. The people who never thought they would have depression or anxiety were developing depression and anxiety. And so I had to personally pivot and work on mindset mentoring and not that it dabbled into medications or services like acupuncture or spiritual guidance or anything like that. But I, it, made me, it made me realize the importance of it. So I found it very intriguing when I found myself knowing people from either my past or present times that were actually you know, focusing their careers on that. And I thought that was so beautiful. And also, too, when it comes to how Monica and I know each other, it's very ironic and it goes so far <laughs> back. But um, as you know, I, or for those of you who don't know, I've been dancing my entire life and Monica shares that same sentiment. And back, I would say, my gosh, how old am I now? It's <laughs> been at least 10 years. Monica and Melly, the girl she was talking to you about earlier, both danced with a company. It was called Lipstick Inc., right? Correct. Yeah, in San Diego. Um, they had beautiful, beautiful performances all over the nightclubs and corporate events all over San Diego. And I was so intrigued by them. And back then I was just getting into the professional world of dancing. And I always admired to be like these two and auditioned for them many times, as well as other, um, companies in San Diego. But that's kind of how we knew of each other. And so over the last 10, 11 years or so, we've just stayed in contact on social media. So the power of social media is wild. So powerful. I love that we can stay connected with people. I mean, I know it has its negative sides, but my favorite thing is that I get to stay connected with people. I probably wouldn't and reconnect with some people too from like high school and hundred percent. It gives that there is, there is such a beautiful thing to it. If people can actually look into that, but you know, even over that time, her and I never talked all of the time as like friends. We just, I'd like your stuff every once in a while, <laughs> like vice versa. But we kind of came together over a unfortunate thing, but I don't want to say it's so unfortunate because it's brought so much good and so much growth. Mm-hmm. And this is just the beginning of it all. But we both were going through some pretty traumatic breakups at the same time. Trauma bonding. Trauma bond. <laughs> hashtag trauma bond. <laughs> I know. So glad we can laugh at this. Trauma bonding isn't probably the best thing, but I do think considering our backgrounds and the mindset we have and our vision for what we want to share and do for others, it was necessary for us to come together and and share our stories and and find uh, this sentiment together. Yeah. We found a lot of common ground and Monica and I had actually never even really connected on a friendship level outside of that. And for the past, I would say four months or so, we've helped each other a lot. And so we decided to come and connect here and share our experiences and not so much to rehash things that we've gone through, but to talk about where we're going from here and the best ways to go about that, because I'm sure she would share these same sentiments, but if I could give the knowledge and the wisdom that I have learned through this process to one woman to help them along the way, then I feel like my work as a mentor is not done obviously, but it's, it's, I'm doing exactly what I need to be doing with the knowledge I have. So 100%. Yeah. So that kind of brought us here. So here we are. And because we share these similar experiences, 
I want to tie it back into the fact that we're both dealing with it from very different places, as we mentioned earlier, with her background and my background. So I wanted to t- I wanted to have Monica talk to you a little bit about her experience first, coming from holistic health and how that has helped her heal mm-hmm. and go through this process. Because I know as a woman, it's not easy to go through trauma. I mean, anyone. I don't want to say women. It's just not easy to go through trauma. It is a thing that is held in your body. And I'm learning this so much more from Monica now, things that I had no idea about. So I want her to talk a little bit about that and what it's meant to her to go through this experience. So absolutely. So in Chinese medicine, we really do believe that the mind and the emotional spirit is, is strongly connected to the body. So it's very common for someone to not only experience the mental, excuse me, the mental, emotional, you know, the sadness, the crying, the anger, it's, it actually physically, and we've kind of shared this and we're going to share it with you today, really can attack your body as well. So I guess I kind of wanted to review my journey. Uh, I guess I'm going to start actually slightly before the breakup without talking about too many details. And we might mention why later, but before the breakup, and I think we all know breakups don't happen really overnight, but things start to fall apart. And I was just feeling sucked dry. And in my head, I knew I, I knew I need to start taking care of me first. But when you're in this kind of broken, confused, unclear, sad state, you, you start making excuses for why you don't take care of yourself, even someone that knows better. However, the thing that I did do One, I'm so blessed to work alongside someone who's a Reiki master. So she was helping me at least try to keep my energy um, somewhat aligned. I was getting acupuncture treatments, but probably not as often for how the the state I was in, Um, but I was still getting them. So there was a level of awareness because I was using my support system um, and a high level professional support system to keep me afloat. But I also sought therapy. As soon as things turned, I was immediately looking for a therapist. And now I have a a wonderful therapist and actually through a pro uh, online program, I guess, program or company called betterhelp.com. So shout out to them because I- was my first therapist was through BetterHelp actually. Yeah, I loved the formatting and I, I was like, why not? It's it's fairly affordable. I can do it through those you know online sessions so I could still have a face-to-face aspect. And I think a lot of therapists are moving to this because of COVID. And I was genuinely surprised of how effective it's been and how supportive I feel. There's also chat-based, and it's funny because my recent research paper for my doctorate program is the efficacy of online-based therapy. And there's something, if someone has some social anxiety, there's actually more benefit to having, not having the physical therapist in front of you. Because it probably just alleviates that like- One stressor. Yeah. And not that I usually have that stress, but I think when you're the kind of like- target of the session, meaning all eyes on you. It's a little intimidating. Super intimidating, especially when you're talking about things you know you're not super comfortable with or you're going to have to face some stuff. It is nice having a little bit of a boundary, but still having someone very present with you and willing to be supportive and helping. So I I made sure to do that. And then stuff hit the fan and, you know, you (laughs) wake up one day and you're like, I got to leave now. (laughs) So that happened. You know, I've had so many friends and people I've known always say those things throughout the course of my life in in different circumstances. Like, you'll just know when you're done. Yep. You'll know when you're done. And there were sometimes people would tell me that, and I'd be like, that is not helpful. Because <laughs> apparently like, I'm not done. Because <laughs> apparently I'm not done. Apparently I'm still going through these like same lessons that I'm learning over and over and over again. And maybe it was I don't know if you felt this way, but. I think I felt so stubborn that I didn't want to accept the truth. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to accept the fact that it wasn't working. Mm -hmm. And I tie this into me being a healer and me being an empath, a true, like true and true. Because 100%. I mean, I admire people who fight tooth and nail, but there comes a point where you fight so hard that you lose yourself and you start disrespecting your own boundaries you start doing things that you, you start breaking your own rules. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So can you relate to that at all? Does yeah. that make, does that hit home for you at all with the moment that you decided it was oh, just yeah. kind of just done? 
Well, in some relationships, we can't help but almost isolate ourselves. I think we've talked about a little bit that a little bit before. And if there's not that third party view to help pull you out of kind of your darkness, I want to say it's like you feel just dark. And but there's also a little bit of light because there's this tangible idea that you're going to get everything you want, the marriage, the kids, the emotional relationship, the moment to put a wedding dress on. I mean, oh it's gosh, all of yeah. our freaking fantasies. I mean, like, let's, let's call spade a spade. <laughs> and you just don't want to let go of it because for some, there's something in you that goes, I don't know if I leave this person, I'm going to find someone else. And yeah. it's, it's so untrue, but every relationship brings out that feeling. And there's an aspect of loyalty. Like I chose to be committed in this relationship. So I want to at least see it out for what it is. So as much as you can, as much as you can. And it's so you're, you're, you know, we hear about this. There's two dichotic messaging. I feel like that comes out in society. There's kind of this slightly religious belief of you need to stay in the marriage. You need to work through problems or, you know, relationship or what have you, cause you were engaged. And then there's this counter idea that, you know what, you shouldn't put up with this stuff. You should never be beaten down you know, women's rights. It's like the polar opposites, you know, it's like, the, or not, is that what I'm trying to say? It's like the two opposite ends of the spectrum. Yes. Completely polar opposites. And so knowing, coming from those two sides of things, you're trying to balance that and see things for what they are. And sometimes to gain clarity, it takes time. Yeah. And everyone's time is different too. And that's what I've been told and what I truly feel as well. And it goes back to, you'll know when you're done Everyone has that breaking point. Some people's breaking points are just different. They're further along. Some people are really freaking quick. Some mm -hmm. people go back and forth. And then there's people who will try every single thing they possibly can until there's nothing left. Yes. Yes. So I think where I was starting to empty that can, that tank, um, but I, I've already kind of made that promise to myself that I've ever found myself in that situation where I was sensing it because maybe my intu intuition's a little higher that I would get out. So I got out. And so the, the few days, maybe for two to three days, it's like you can't eat, you can't drink water. Your, your body just feels not only heavy, but like, like you're kind of just sink into the floor, into the, gr I mean, it it's is just numbing. so numbing and painful. I bounced. I mean, I was living with this gentleman. So I was bouncing around houses and girlfriends and like in between like the shock of I just made this decision and I mean I had to make this decision but even when I look back or and try to find a place to live and start my school semester and <laughs> deal with my business it's not ideal no. and you know I just I gave myself space and that's what I appreciate appreciate about having the friends that I have is they're like just Take it, take all the help. And this time I did, I had an amazing friend. He, you know, I call, I, he was the first person I text because this happened over the middle, middle of the night. And I just was like, I mean, this is what's happening. And he's like, you need to get out now, pack a bag and get out now. So I didn't even sleep. I packed a bag and got out and, you know, made that space for myself because the biggest thing you have to remember energetically is when you're in someone's energetic field, there's definitely no clarity within. Yeah, you have blinders on your face. It's honestly. like being a horse in a race. And that's exactly what I, it, it feels like. You just don't see anything else. Yeah. And so I knew I was in between, like those blinders were like, shoo, shoo, shoo. <laughs> like they're kind of off, they're kind of on, they're kind of off, they're kind of on. All I knew was, I needed to figure this out. So I immediately left. And I mean, when I left, it felt done. However, I still needed to move out. And, you know, what would have been convenient was finding the place, leaving my stuff, going back, packing. Nope. I found a storage unit and I did that with my friend helped me do that. And other friends, one friend came down from LA. I had a other friends. I mean, everybody was honestly, one of the most beautiful things I witnessed was that the community I've served was serving me back in a time of need. And that just, I mean, amidst the darkness made me like, Monica, you're a good person. This I was just isn't say that. your fault. I was just going to say that. And that truly shows you when you are a good person, you have those good people around you. 
and they come to help. They, they hun- truly do. 100% do. So for a couple days, I felt really low. And then, I mean, even actually at the end of the second day, though, I stayed with my girlfriend, Natalie. And, I mean, we were already laughing about it because... <laughs> <laughs> kind of have to laugh through the pain sometimes. <sighs> Honestly, I know that sounds so cheesy, but you have to. You have you to. You have to. Because some of the stuff I found out, which we're not really going to go in today, is like ludicrous. It's it's <laughs> ludicrous. It's insane. The, it, <laughs> the things people think they can get away with is it's hilarious. Out of, it's out of control, to be honest with you. But you know what? It has just shined a huge light on things for me that there are so many wounded people. People. 100%. And, and I'm not trying to say I laugh at that because of that. I laugh at it to help myself heal. But when I look at the situations and I'm just like, oh my God, like what the fuck? <laughs> like, like lame as fuck. Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh my God. It, it just, it just shows me, okay, there are a lot of people that you are going to interact with on your daily basis and also in your relationships and friendships that are wounded and they have stuff that they haven't dealt with. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, that stuff gets projected on the people closest to them. And it's very hard to not take things personal. So hard. And that was one reason why I thought this was very important to talk about, not to shed light on the drama of breakups or why it happened or Mm -hmm. whatever, because that's honestly not the part that matters. Mm -hmm. The part that matters is bringing light that when these things happen to most people, especially the people who are not awake to the ideas that it's not them per se in some situations, it makes them feel small. It can make them feel small. I know I've been in that position too in different, insert, let me start over, in certain circumstances. And I became that small person, which then made the situation personally for me even worse because I was not aware enough at the time. So I want to bring some awareness to this and share these experiences and have you share your experience because you are a very awake person and you know yourself and you are self-aware and it still got to you. It still got to me. And to be honest, I've talked about this with, you know, a lot of my girlfriends are mediums and very intuitive people, which I really appreciate. They're amazing. They do amazing work for people, especially in the Uh, realm of trauma and emotional healing. And I actually did a reading with one, my girlfriend, Cheryl, uh, recently, and she just really brought light that one of the biggest turning points I had recently, um, not to kind of jump ahead, was her just telling me, like, you are really traumatized by this. And it was so, so, you know, I kind of just and I've done this before in the past with other types of trauma. I had stuff to do. I had to just shove it aside, even though I was trying not to do that. But school was piling up. I had to be there for my patients. And I was trying to get whatever I could done. But I knew I wasn't really moving through it. But I, I kind of didn't have a choice. So that's what's difficult is we're balancing life while trying to deal with our, our shit. And I wasn't really able to fully take that opportunity. However... The one thing I, I did control was putting, what environments was I putting myself into? That's so huge. Oh Be- my gosh. <laughs> so my work environment is my best friend who's a healer and completely supportive. She is my friend and practically sister first and foremost. And then I was very picky about my roommate situation. One, I identified that I don't do well living alone. I know some people might not agree with that, but I know I'm a personality type that I will drown in my depression and my sorrow if I'm left to it alone. I need a little bit of positive distraction, positive lifestyle, positive environment to move myself out of it. And I found an amazing roommate who, um, she's actually one of my patients and friends, and she's in a similar place in her life where she's in her early 30s, looking for love, but strong and independent, similar financial situation. And I knew putting myself in that around that type of person on a day-to-day basis. And she also has two cute kitties because animal love is the best too, (laughs) was going to be a healing aspect for me. Um, And it's funny because she got a reading and it, 
And that person told her, this move is really good for you. And she had been struggling with, you know, I mean, COVID has been rough for a lot of people. In so many ways, too. Having to move your work life to home and you're all by yourself at home all day, it just isn't the best for a lot of people. And so we were able to come together and be there for each other very recently. And it's been huge. Like, I kind of miss her right now. Oh, that's, <laughs> she's gone. But that's such an awesome sign. I personally, this is the first time that I've ever lived alone in my life. It's taught me a lot. I will say that. I'm still not sure yeah. if I like it or I'm just saying I like it. But what it did teach me was how to be with myself. Because mm-hmm. that is one thing that I have truly understood that I needed to understand more. Mm-hmm. And it's shown me a lot about who I was in bad ways and good ways. But it is really important you figure out what's best for you. Exactly. And for me, what I did realize is I needed to be out of the toxic environments that I was putting myself in, in many different ways. And it allowed me to heal myself mentally, emotionally, physically. I mean, every, every way, every way. So I, I find that interesting and really awesome that you can be aware of yourself and know, you know what, this is the kind of environment that I need to thrive. And 100%. put yourself in that position. Something I wanted to ask you about too, because I have been learning so much about trauma and what trauma is. And I think it's a word that people are scared to use because relating it to my own personal experiences, I thought saying I had trauma sounded dramatic. Mm-hmm. And I was also led to believe I was a very dramatic person. And I'm not. Nope. I don't I don't believe that. I don't think there's a lot of dramatic people, especially when it comes to expressing your emotions. You are the way you are and that's okay. But what I was trying to learn was that there are different levels to trauma and also how trauma shows up in the body and in the mind. And you brought a lot of light to it, to me, about what I'm experiencing, even the fact mm-hmm. that, you know, you can come and be next to me and be like, oh my gosh, Christina, I need to like give you a treatment. Yeah. You know, so I, if you wouldn't mind, I'd love to kind of hear about how that works for you and how you recognize it in yourself and in your patients. 100%. Uh, so... My first bout of experiencing kind of like a traumatic whiplash. So what's interesting is a lot of times when I'm actually going and during the trauma, traumatic event, if you will, um, I will kind of go into this almost get down to business mode. Mm -hmm. I shut off and I'm like, let's move. Like, let's get this done. We're doing it. You know, it's usually involved, obviously, another person, relationships, family members, et cetera. And so you move through it, and then I get, the first time I experienced a pretty intense trauma, um, it wasn't really the first time, but uh, a more exaggerated time from the from a previous time I experienced some. It took maybe several months to almost a year, and then I started experiencing really severe panic disorder, where, I mean, I could barely function. I had, I mean, it was weird nightfall would hit I would see the sun go down and my hands and my whole body would just start shaking and I would have this weird tunnel sensation tunnel vision and I wasn't like am I going crazy like because mental disorder does run in my family and so I started having this like feeling like oh my god like and then panicking even more because I'm thinking because you're panicking yeah like so it's anxiety over anxiety panicking over panicking and it I wouldn't say I was hyperventilating but it was heart was racing and thumping. I was so uncomfortable in my own skin. And I wasn't really sure why it was happening. I had mild anxiety for years, but when it hit me like that, I was like, I couldn't function. I don't know how I'm going to get through this. It's one of the most paralyzing feelings. And I know people with anxiety know exactly what you're talking about. And people who don't experience it are like, how is that possible? Exactly. It's really hard to empathize with. It's kind of like the other examples, like migrants. When people don't get migraines, it's really hard to empathize. If you don't give birth to a baby, you don't know. <laughs> you just don't know the pain until you know the pain. <laughs> so um, with that said, I, I was I was living alone at the time. Actually, this is what taught me that for me personally, I mean, I was I ended up to a point, I was so desperate. I would like go upstairs and knock on the neighbor's door. I was like, I just need to be around someone. So I don't know. I'm not going crazy. Just another energy just in the room with you. Just to keep me on earth yeah. a little bit. It was so fear, such an affair. Like I was running from a tiger. 
Yeah. My sympathetic system was just on overdrive and looking back on it. And so let me, let me regurgitate back. Uh, my teacher, I went to my mentor, my acupuncturist, uh, who at school and I, I looked at him, I was like, yeah, you have to help me through this. I can't do this. And it took a little bit of time because the herbal medicine, it's, it's, it's tough to get a straight diagnosis that's perfect off the bat. Um, and I'll never forget the day. We tried a couple formulas. They made me feel a little bit calmer, but they weren't doing it. And then this one form formulation, it was called Yigan Sanja Chenpi Bancha Tang. That's a mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wish I knew the Latin translation off the top of my head, but in case any uh, Chinese medicine people are listening. Um, and I took the formulation and it was like, I, I'll never forget the, where I was sitting in clinic, how I was oriented at the table. And it was just like, I was back in my skin and the anxiety just went away. And that's when I started realizing how physical the one that the trauma was but to how beautifully spiritual and energetic the herbs were. So right. it was this overlap. And I took the formula for, and I was seeking therapy at the time as well. And I only had maybe a couple flare ups of panic that I always had the herbs on hand. Cause prior to that I did try Xanax mm -hmm. and it did not work. It did not work for now, me. Did it not work because you didn't like the way it made you feel or it just didn't work in general? It would kind of take me out. But then as soon as I, it would alleviate the panic got worse. It was like worsening. So it's terrible. Yeah. <laughs> no offense, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've, per I've personally never, I've taken like Xanax once or twice for like emergency purposes when I was experiencing panic attacks that were situational and they were, I didn't know what to do. Yeah. But to, to me, I literally felt like I was just, it took away every bit of my being yeah you go same, numb I go yeah I went numb and I just I remember I could just sit there and have tears streaming down my face and just be like it is what it is and I'm like oh that is not helpful to me it's it's numbing and I could see how people could get addicted to that feeling because they don't they just don't want to feel anything, anything. and that's not really the idea um what am I trying to say here that's not how to heal no it's a band-aid it's a band-aid like most and I won't say all, mm -hmm. like most pharmaceuticals, unfortunately, especially in the mental, emotional field, I, in pain field, actually, um, I just truly feel their Band-Aids. And then, I mean, how beautiful an experience to actually feel an herbal formula that powerful. I had no side effects. I continued to take that formula, uh, strong doses for about 30 days. So maybe three times a day, like a uh, one to two grams of this like granulated formula, which are derived from Chinese medicinal herbs. And then maybe a scoop a day and I kind of just held it around. Like I used to hold Xanax in case. Um, and then it went away and it was probably, I mean, even things like my back pain went away, my periods regulated. I mean, when you're talking about Chinese medicinal formulas, they really do complete an internal imbalance. And so what I'll reflect back on that trauma is that when I experienced it, I stopped eating right. I would stay up all night to handle the, the issue. So many bad habits start happening. All these bad habits that I did not do in this particular one, except I had no appetite. So there was still some things like it was really hard to drink water, eat food for a few days. And so I was still maintaining relatively healthy habits. The worst one was probably, and I don't think this has anything to do with COVID quarantine. Yes, I don't have access to a gym, but when things started getting harder at home during the, the relationship, I stopped making working out a priority. I was honestly taking care of his kid. So it got uh, really hard to prioritize myself, especially with a little one around. Um, but fast forward, I think the reason I'm moving a little bit better out of this trauma is because I'm aware that these healthy habits have to stick around so that I can heal faster. Right. And even when it doesn't come to Chinese medicine, kind of going back to where I thought about a lot of what you did and why it helped people, the girls who I was helping mentally, they were not able to do their home workouts or their nutritional plans, even though they had access to their food and 
their equipment to do the things that they needed to do because their mental state wasn't right, which in turn, like you're saying, whether it was trauma or not, they weren't able to do these things because they were developing all of these unhealthy habits that were making them kind of just spiral out of control. So it just goes to show you that when there are traumas or just experiences in your life that are going on inside of you or around you, you start to not do the things you need to do to make yourself well. The truth is it's a form of depression Yeah, where you get unmotivated and you also simultaneously, I mean, depression is actually like a, a true um, medical issue. You start not, you have a physical heaviness. You're tired all the time. It's hard to get out of bed. I mean, it's a well, it's a big circle of, of symptoms. Mm -hmm. So if you have nothing to help pull you out of that, then it's going to be really hard to attack any type of goal. Right. Now, what would you say to somebody who does not have access to things like Chinese medicine or they just don't have the means to make these kinds of things happen? Like, is there anything that you've learned in this whole experience? I want to call it an experience because whether it was good or bad, there have been things that have come from it that have, I can say I can speak on both of our behalfs on this, that have made us better people 100%. and that has made us grow in so many different ways and have a lot of realizations. Do you think there there's a few things that you can take from what you experienced and the process that would help other people specifically without Chinese medicine or without things that yeah, they don't have access Without the to. tools. Without the tools, yeah. Number one is to kind of pardon yourself and give yourself patience. But also there's things that you can do, whether it be via prayer, meditation that's free, uh, taking that time, not burdening yourself on a schedule, talking to a friend, you know, asking for help. There are free resources. So what I mean, what I like to do when I'm feeling, everybody has experienced this before, where you know you are struggling to get something done if, if it's only on your free will. I always tell people, like, find a coach. And the coach doesn't have to be a person. It could be a podcast and someone walking you through mindset stuff like this, just hearing someone else's story and knowing there's a light at the ten end of the tunnel, uh, working on mindset stuff like you. There's so much free resources online. Instagram, type in hashtag mindset. <laughs> I know. I think you just honestly have to be open and willing to know that you can be a student for mindset practices and to making yourself a better person. And it doesn't take necessarily going to a doctor or getting Chinese medicine or going to those, to those routes to use those tools. You can just do things like this. And that was a big reason why I even started this podcast. Mm -hmm. Because like you said, listening to someone else's story and resonating with someone and understanding that you are not the only one that's gone through these things is huge. It, and it also makes you feel a little bit more calm mm -hmm. to go through those things and just be able to be like, wow, there are people out there who are willing to share their stories in order to help somebody. Mm -hmm. And yeah, a lot of free resources, a ton. I mean, that's kind of how I started to get better was I started YouTubing things. I started looking on Instagram. That might be a, a awesome thing to put into the show notes is any free resources for people that are struggling out there that might be listening and either don't have the money, don't have access to the type of care they think they need. Yeah. And also I know COVID brought out a lot of that too, because COVID put people in situations that, I don't know, they shouldn't have had to go through. Yeah. Um, you know, a, a really abusive relationships or, you know, you have a bunch of kids and a husband and things are a little bit more complicated. You can't get out of your relationship. There's could be drugs involved. I mean, this can get really heavy, but there are people who I don't think have access to these things and start feeling helpless. 100%. And I can't even, I can't relate to how that must feel. So if, you know, if somebody's listening to this and is feeling helpless, you know, I just want to extend a hand and an ear and Monica and I are always here to be reached out to if you need some extra guidance on getting out of situations that are really terrible. But we wanted to bring to light that there are a lot of free resources to reach out to for help if you are experiencing any kinds of severe depression and anxiety where you do feel stuck because I never thought I would be in a situation where I would feel like this in my entire life. I pride myself on being a pretty fucking strong person and I got to a place where I was not. 
So I can only imagine how it is for others who experience things on even a deeper level than I have. So absolutely. Would, are you comfortable with sharing some of the physical sensations that you're having? Oh uh, my gosh. Yeah. And I mean, it's, it's definitely changed over time. Um, when things were its worst, when I first started phys- physically feeling trauma, I, I cried a lot, a lot, but I'm also a very sensitive person. So I didn't really think that much into it. I didn't think that that was anything different. And like I said, I wasn't trying to categorize myself as traumatized. Mm -hmm. That word was hard for me to even grasp. And this was before I went to my therapist who was a trauma specialist and actually shed light on it. But I would experience a lot of agitation, um, night terrors. I couldn't sleep. I was restless and my racing thoughts were out of, out of control. I, um, yeah, I, I just couldn't get them under control. But in the first time I actually had like a physical response, I remember going through something that triggered the feelings of what traumatized me in the first place. And I couldn't get my breathing under control. And I remember I was going to be getting on a plane. I had a flight the next morning and I was trying to pack for my flight and I couldn't get it together. And I remember thinking, okay, Christina, all you need to do is call your clients or just text message them and tell them that you cannot come tomorrow and cancel your flight. You have Southwest. It's fine. Like I was trying to give myself all of the tools to understand, like, you're not going to lose your money. Your clients will understand. I could not even get myself to go to my computer and simply get on the website to type in Southwest.com to go switch that flight because the act of doing that was so taxing in my brain, which it obviously is not that hard to get on a computer, but I couldn't move. And I felt like I was being dramatic. And I found myself like on my bathroom floor, just sitting there trying to gain composure. And it was getting worse and worse and worse. And I remember reaching out to a woman who I knew who does Reiki. Mm -hmm. And it was really ironic because she had an office in the salon I worked at at the time. And we were supposed to have a session that week. Wow. (laughs) And I know it was really, really ironic. But I, I text messaged her and I'm like, I told her what was happening. And she kind of talked me through it. And I remember going back out in the living room when I finally could compose myself. I couldn't even tell my significant other at the time what was I was experiencing because I hadn't experienced it to that level. And he also had never dealt with someone with anxiety. He's told, he would tell me he didn't know what it felt like, which I can understand because not everyone knows what that feels like. He also didn't know how to comfort me. And I didn't know how to soothe myself at the time. So it was just a recipe for a disaster and... But yeah, I was just hot and cold and shaky and I couldn't stop crying. Like, and it was a different kind of crying for me. It was, it was deep. Like it wasn't just like tears streaming down my face and like hysteric hysterics. It was just like, it was like someone had died. Like Mm -hmm. that's, that's the only way I can explain it. And I feel even dramatic saying it like that, but that in reality is what a panic attack would be like for me. Mm -hmm. And that's when it wasn't too long after that, that I had gotten talk therapy in person for the first time. Like I had told you, I had done the better help in the very beginning for a few months, but my therapist and I weren't connecting. And that's another thing too. You have to find the right person because not everyone will work. All types of practitioners, Reiki, acupuncture. I tell people sometimes we ain't going to click and that's okay. Please go find someone. Yeah. And that's, that's so understanding. And if you ever go to a therapist and you're like, you know what, this isn't working. That doesn't mean it's not working. That just means you haven't found your match and the person who's there for you. And the person who I wound up going to, he was a, um, what was, I forget exactly. I don't want to butcher his, his credentials, but he specialized in PTSD and trauma work Mm -hmm. and addictions for people, which I didn't have an addiction, but that's, that's what he did. And he made me very aware that I was suffering from complex post-traumatic stress disorder, which when he said that to me in my face, I was like, what, (laughs) what did you, what did you just say? I automatically thought, I mean, I think PTSD is when people are at war and when they get in car accidents or when they've witnessed something horrendous, Mm -hmm. I didn't realize that there were levels to post-traumatic stress disorder that classified as complex, which Mm -hmm was reflective of to what I was experiencing. So it wasn't until he logically could sit me down and be like, this is what you're experiencing. 
tell me where it's at in your body. And I was like, what do you mean? And, and this was, I mean, I didn't know anything back then. So he would bring me, he would run me through drills to kind of try and identify where I was feeling it. And, you know, we'd, we'd work through trauma that way, but it wasn't until then that I started feeling normal because he was like, this is something that happens and it's okay. And, you know, you think that you're crazy for experiencing this because you never thought you'd be able to experience something like this because of what you've gone through. But I need to break that ideology for you because not that you're wrong. You just were uneducated about the fact that this could happen. Absolutely. Well, thank you for sharing. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's almost like it feels good to be able to talk about this now because for the longest time, I never in a million years thought I'd be able to talk about it. And I would be lying if I told you that getting on a public platform and talking about it didn't raise some kind of anxiety for me for a very long time for many reasons. Absolutely. But I'm glad to be able to share it because I think that these things help people. And a lot of people like experienced like yourself the feeling like it's happening to me and I it was I had the same experience when I first had a panic attack it's like me yeah like what? I get straight A's <laughs> like I you know I'm composed like what yeah. is going on how can I be so helpless well and to me too I know you all don't know Monica on a personal level but she's somebody who I would look at and be like that's a bad bitch like <laughs> she's like a confident person you wouldn't think those things happening to people who carry themselves that way, who can hold their own, who are educated, who have been through the motions of different things in their life. You think that they'd be the person that could just hold it together as I saw myself as well. So that I, I hope that gives some of you guys listening a, a different viewpoint on the fact that we all experience these things and you are not abnormal for experiencing anything. And it can happen to anyone. We're all subject to trauma. And because hurt people hurt people. <laughs> That's yeah. part of it too. Yeah. Now, do you think, if you think back to like your past, um, I don't know how far you want to go back with that, but is there anything from your past that you seem to, maybe now looking at it from a different perspective, correlate to situations that you found yourself in or people that you found yourself with or anything mm -hmm. like that? Well, I definitely have this pattern. There's a few things, but I definitely have this pattern starting as early as high school where I would date someone. They'd pursue me incredibly aggressively. Like then, love bomb? Would we, be like, able to, would we be able to say that? Yeah, love bomb, <laughs> pretty much. Um, they would pursue me very aggressively, and then within a two- to three-month window – it almost never fails. I get so much anxiousness two months into something with someone. <laughs> um, like, they just bounce. And, you know, I mean, they might have a conversation with me. But they're like, I can't do this anymore. And that cycle has repeated 10 to 20 times over the last over a decade, maybe more. I, I don't want to go through the numbers. So the sense of abandonment that causes me to have an anxious attachment style. So I do know that some, t some of the things that the person I just dated brought up, they were totally valid. But I do know that I I held a certain amount of awareness and I was willing to talk through it, get whatever help, you know, so. And that's huge. And I knew I was doing everything right. I can't walk into a relationship perfectly healed. That is. That's kind of unrealistic. Super unrealistic. So if you're out there thinking that you need all this time, I don't know if you're ever, that's like, what what is transcendence ascendance <laughs> like what is, is it, that and that's such a hard concept because i feel like i've dealt with that recently where i'm like i need to be alone for months on end and i need to make sure i'm 100 percent healed and i'm like do we ever do that because i don't think we do i just think that we have to enter in the next relationship or any anything that we go into as the best version of ourselves. Yeah. And the most healed we can be mm -hmm. doing the work that we need to do and being completely aware of it and not trying to stuff it down. And just like working out and fitness, working on our healing doesn't end at Ever. any time. You're always going to have the likelihood that the trauma is going to bubble up again from long, long ago. Right. So it is like fitness. It is like diet. I, all it's these work. things. It's Mindset work. takes work. It takes every day doing gratitude, 
affirmations, journaling, meditating, whatever that is for you, that regimen, those are just some recommendations, low key. Uh, it takes a, a daily accumulation and consistency to feel a certain way every day. Right. I didn't mean to take you off track with that, but I wanted to go back to what you were talking about with the abandonment and the anxious attachment style, mm-hmm. because that I relate to a hundred percent because I feel like I've shared many experiences just like you when it comes to relationships and that, but I'm also aware that I am like that. I know what makes me anxious. I'm very cognizant of that. And unfortunately, when you are with somebody who brings that out and magnifies it, it really intensifies it. A hundred percent. And especially if it's like, unfortunately in like a betrayal or something where you don't have control over it. Mm -mm. And that makes you very vulnerable and just like it takes your anxiousness and sends it through the fricking roof. Let's be real. Yes. But I wanted to ask you like in those moments, you know, post breakup with the cycle that you experience, what did you feel like? Because Mm -hmm. I don't know if people really understand what abandonment issues are. Mm -hmm. And if they do, maybe there's like a negative connotation with it because I know when people would tell me I have abandonment issues, I would be pissed (laughs) before, (laughs) before I was aware because I don't, I don't see it as, a, I, I felt like when I would look at it before, I would look at it like it was this like dark cloud over me. That's like, oh, abandonment issues, <laughs> like yeah. label. And it, you just have to understand that it comes from something. Mm-hmm. I have a really hard time with labels, especially in the mental health department. Same. But I get it. It's the only mm-hmm. way to, to kind of measure right. it and hopefully to find treatment. But labels are, are very, very difficult. So it's easy to feel that way about something like abandonment. I'd never been really labeled. I self-labeled myself. <laughs> I know too much. Um, and my therapist happens, you're is very like, educated. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, but you just have to, you have, you can't put weight on it. It's mm-hmm. more, it's more, okay. I see that I have abandonment issues. What, what's the result? What's my, what's my path? And so things that I've learned to do is one, I have to keep my circle. And something that we like to do when we get in relationships is isolate. And I make sure that my boyfriend meets my friends. They know where I live. They know where I'm at. How do we maintain a social structure where I don't just go into like, this is, you know, my life now. Yeah. Because you do lose yourself like that. You do. you kind of do it. I think sometimes we do it subconsciously. We totally do it subconsciously. I still managed. I didn't do it. Thankfully, like I said, my best friend was working in my office. So I knew I had a little buffer zone there, but... I kept being too busy, too consumed with his child, and I ended up still isolating myself. Luckily, I had made new friends in that neighborhood and was able to like find other types of support really quickly because I, I kind of that's the awareness radar that I do have. I sense something's wrong. Who can I run to? Yeah, you know. So I think that's really important for people to to women to recognize in men is. If you have trusted beloved friends and family, make sure they know what's going on in your relationship. That whole idea of you got to keep it. Oh, that triggers me. Quiet (laughs) and alone. Why would you, why would you tell someone our stuff? Yeah. I'm not going to tell the world. Well, yes, because there's also a boundary there where your relationship is your relationship. But if someone's making you feel like you can't, they don't want you to talk about it because it would shine the light on how they're treating you. Yes. I feel like there's a little bit of a, a, a lot of bit of a difference between that. But that, so that seemingly slowly grows though. That doesn't just happen off the bat. No, it's very, um, yeah, it's just slow. And it, it just could develops. be one or two people that honestly just know what's going on, you know, and you, and kind of see you. Yeah. Or even you, if you, like you have you. a couple friend, like you guys are, friends with another couple that are very close to you and you can just share those experiences. So you guys have a support system. Mm -hmm. I think that's really important than just isolating you and this other person to the entire world. I feel like I've always done that, but then there have been definitely times where I definitely have overshared for help, but I think it's maybe finding that common ground. Or when you looked back, not to cut you off, but when you looked back, I mean, wouldn't you say, man, I wish I shared a little bit more? Yes. 
And that's, and that's, I think that's my own struggle and my own personal thing because I believed I had shared too much, but in reality, I was reaching for help. Mm -hmm. I was reaching for support because I couldn't understand what the fuck was happening. You were trying to find validation. I was trying to find some kind of validation. And so I was just leaning for support and it was, and to be very honest with you, and I can say this a hundred percent, every time I would reach out to people, it wasn't to gossip. It was actually to ask for help for our relationship. It was never to just be like, oh my God, so-and-so did this to me, or you won't believe this. It wasn't just to vent. It was, oh my gosh, I am feeling weak. Like I need someone to either slap me in the face and like wake me up Mm -hmm. or offer me some kind of advice as to what they would do, Mm -hmm. which I think is healthy. And yeah, you're right. Looking back on it now, I wish maybe I would have shared more Mm -hmm. because maybe it would have woken me up quicker to the fact that this wasn't the right situation for me. And it wasn't the right environment. It wasn't the right match. But then again, it's in the past. You can't really like go back, but it is important to reflect and learn and to be aware of what you were just talking about as to why you wound up in those situations based on your past. For me, I'm like, okay, were there feelings of unworthiness ever in my life where I was constantly trying to find somebody to make happy so I felt better, Mm -hmm. which is an interesting thing to talk about because because this is something that I'm still growing and learning from on a regular basis. But when you start trying to people please and make someone else happy to make you happy, you're filling their cup and you're not Mm -hmm. filling your own. And so that energy exchange and that balance is so out of whack. I was so drained. Oh my God. (laughs) I'll never forget the Reiki session I I had with Melly and she's like, girl, you tired. There's 12 (laughs) entities on you. I don't know if you guys know what that means, but you can look it up. <laughs> I gotta Another episode. <laughs> had to call in a crazy archangel to like, take those out. And, and it's funny because I still didn't do it. Well, I was taking action in small ways, but I wasn't, that wasn't enough. Yeah. Still. Because if you imagine how I must have felt if someone's saying that to me, I felt dark. I felt depleted. I didn't have energy around my schedule to and I remember thinking, when could I possibly even talk about it with this yeah. person? You know, so it's just interesting. Again, it's it's hard to pull yourself out it's dark. of those moments until enough mm-hmm. is enough. You know what someone said to me once? I actually forget who the first person was that said this to me, but the moment that I realized I wasn't myself was someone told me I looked like a shell of myself. Mm-hmm. And I was like, damn, like coming from a per and this is how I see myself like I see myself as a very light happy bubbly person so to see myself in the mirror and not see that was sad Mm -hmm. but to also have people tell me that you're like a shell of who you are Christina like I don't know where that person went and I had people I don't know who the first person was but my best friends my Mm -hmm. clients people who were actually even on social media who didn't even know me in person. It made me very aware that I was, it was whatever was weighing on me was so heavy. And I was trying so hard to do something that wasn't working until like you said, enough is enough or something happens where you're like, I cannot stay any longer. Mm -mm. And you make them and you make that move. And no matter how hard it is. (laughs) Yeah. And I, I think honestly too, what keeps a lot of people from making that move is understanding that the healing process is going to be huge and it's going to be just as painful or maybe even more painful than the actual process of letting go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So speaking on letting go and speaking on moving forward, what does the future look like for you now? I know it's been not that long since Mm -mm. you've kind of cut ties with this experience experience <laughs> when, if you will. yeah um so you know what what do you feel like right now yeah so i'm two and a half months out at first like the very first little r- few days were obviously really hard but as i went through i thought i was doing better i even started being slightly more social and seeing my friends and it felt really good and then i came down with strep throat and i kid you not there is nobody with strep throat around i was me. gonna say that's like are we in high school? <laughs> so yeah. So there. So if you believe in the chakra systems, the throat chakra is a lot about. I mean, 
not surprisingly, about speaking your truth. And it's also got a strong linkage to opening up the heart. Because if you're not speaking up your truth, your heart tends to close up with it. At least that's what I've learned from Ellie. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, sorry. Sounds, sounds about right. <laughs> that is not my expertise. I'll, I'll talk to you about the spleen and the kidneys and stuff. But um, it it was such a dramatic experience. And then I had to get on the antibiotics. And when I got on the antibiotics, so I felt like I purged something through my throat. And another symptom I've been dealing with, which started, I can't recall exactly when, but it intensified for sure, if not started while in that relationship, I started having driving anxiety on the on the freeway. And how I experienced that was, it's people are like, oh, you're just anxious? I'm like, no, I'm not stressed about driving. I'm an aggressive driver. It would physically show up as, I don't know, swallow. I don't know, swallow. And then I, oh, I can't breathe. I don't know, like manually trying to breathe and swallow. And then I'd start panicking because I feel like I'm going to pass out. And so I start slowly moving over to the so lane and sometimes have to pull off the road. And now, I mean, I'm still at the point where to not intensify my anxiety, I take the back roads all the way to work. Which Just so you know, you won't experience any triggers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Especially if I'm going to be a happy-go-lucky patient care provider. I, I just, it's been incredibly crazy, but it was interesting that the strep, that feeling in my throat, it's all like in it's my relative. throat, you know, cause I wasn't, I felt so like quieted in that relationship. Anything I said was wrong, you know? So it's, it's very interesting seeing it. If I'm not going to deal with it and maybe this podcast is a, a form of me using my throat chakra, you don't know, but seeing it purge itself if I wasn't willing to do it myself. And I talked about, I've actually spoke about a little bit of the funny part, I guess, of the breakup on a podcast, which I don't know was the best idea because it <laughs> kind of started up. Um, but, uh, you know, fast forward, I'm still having some symptoms. I, then the antibiotics, because I don't know if you guys know, there's actually research that shows that there's an 80% chance that you'll develop depression from taking an antibiotic, which I did in, because... The other thing I experienced during the relationship, I was starting to have a flare up of GI issues, which is so crazy that I would be experiencing those type of issues now because I've come so far in my health journey. I thought it was odd. And but I don't was, they say, it, don't, don't a lot of stressors ruminate in your gut? Yes, yes. And I mean, if you think about it, if you're in sympathetic mode constantly versus parasympathetic mode, you have to go into parasympathetic mode to digest properly. So if I'm in sympathetic mode all the time, which was interesting because it started even when things weren't going wrong. And I, I want to talk a little bit about intuition. That's, yeah, I really am glad you even brought that up because it's... It was like my body knew, and sometimes my body does it, I'm not going to lie, around the vaginal area, but now I can That's say <laughs> it gives me some signs. Like, it doesn't like this person. He's not good for you. But my stomach, she knows <laughs> my stomach was legitimately talking to me and, and feeling pre precipitating what was going to happen before I could register. And I did energetic things. I found some stuff in labs and nothing. It got better, but it wasn't gone. And then I'll never forget the way, like how much it improved just by leaving him. Yeah. So that was really interesting. So the experience moving forward taught me a lot about trusting my own intuition and what that looks like. Cause you can be like, Oh, I think that's, I think that's a level. It's a whole nother level. It's yeah. real fun to be a healer. Yeah, It's, uh, <laughs> it's kind of scary to be honest with you. I had friends always joke to me about like, gosh, Christina, you just know things. And we just, we'd make a big joke about it, but it was unfortunate because my past relationship really dimmed down my intuition because I would feel and know all of these things, but I was kind of manipulated into understanding that they weren't happening, mm -hmm. but they were happening. And so it clouded my judgment. And so for a long time, I fell out of my intuitive mode, mm -hmm. which led me to not trusting myself, which led me to not knowing myself, which led me to all of my self-worth issues. And, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's a, it's a downward spiral it really to is. losing yourself to becoming what, you know, my friends would say, you're a shell of yourself, Christina. And I was like, holy shit. <laughs> so I, I don't even don't be saying this to me. I, I know, please. <laughs> like that was like the hardest thing for me to hear. But, you know, as I started speaking my truth and having a voice again, because I didn't have one, mm -hmm. I couldn't like, I, I don't even know how to explain it, but I couldn't speak. 
Mm-hmm. And I felt like, and that's, you know, podcast, everything. I was so freaking scared to start this, but that's the whole fearless thing that we'll go back into later. The mentality, not mm-hmm. actually being fearless because we can be scared as fuck, but yeah, it's the attitude still of, take action. Yes. Taking action through fear. Mm-hmm. Plain and simple. It's not, okay. Not plain and simple, but it's um, really hard. Actually, it's, it's actually really hard, <laughs> but uh, where was I going with this? Um, oh, it just taught me to start trusting myself again. Mm-hmm. And when I started trusting myself again and listening to myself, it brought back that intuitive side of me that knew exactly what to do and when to do it. And it was like a light bulb went off. And it's been the most beautiful experience ever since. And, you know, people always say there's a light at the end of the tunnel, a light at the end of the tunnel for these types of things. And I couldn't see it for a very long time. And that's relationships, careers, life experiences. That's, that's everything. Mm-hmm. But I, I couldn't see it because my intuition was not, I don't want to say not working. It was probably blocked. It if you blocked. know the chakra, s- chakra s- system, excuse me, uh, your intuition really resides in your third eye. And just like your throat, my throat chakra is blocked. Just like your heart, your your uh, third eye can be blocked. It just reminded me, we did a, a Reiki, <laughs> I forget, maybe a Reiki level two class that Melly taught at my practice. And she was <laughs> checking my chakras and I was like, uh, <laughs> it, it was like, you in a bad place, yeah, girl. I was going to say. I was like, damn. She's like, oh my God. I was like, <laughs> Oh man, I don't know about this. Uh, like, like it's like I had to admit it. I just started. It was just it was gonna come out. Yeah, you know the lie I was telling myself. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the thing too. When you start lying to yourself about how you're actually really feeling, I'm, I feel like that kind of dims down your intuition because mm-hmm. it's there trying to tell you like, hello, like mm-hmm. you, know, you know, you know, but you you don't want to believe it. Mm-hmm. So you start telling yourself lies and start making up excuses for yourself and. And what I wanted to say along the lines of the trust thing is I think it's really important to give yourself space to know that you should treat yourself like you would treat someone, someone you loved. else, someone you loved who broke trust with you, you know, because they don't just gain it back. They have to earn it. Right. So there's a similar relationship that happens with ourselves that it takes time to kind of earn our own trust back. And that's OK. It it takes time and you have to be kind to yourself in the process too I beat myself up a lot same for yeah mm-hmm. and it was a lot of shame I think too because I'm like damn like you should have known better Christina like why did you do x y and z or whatever but then I had to realize like I was not as wise or as educated or aware mm-hmm. as I was then so I have to start being really a lot I start being nicer to my younger self even if that younger self was younger Christina 2019 Mm -hmm. like let's be real that I I have to be kind to her to understand how to heal myself so one trick that I've um, been told to do well one I want to bring up the idea of forgiveness and I'll I'll be honest with you I ain't there yet (laughs) (laughs) I love how you got really close to the microphone (laughs) all creepy (laughs) I'm kind of creepy See, self-admitting <laughs> awareness. Um, I'm not there yet. It's something I'm working on. I forgive a lot. I'm very much so someone that can forgive others, but this one's going to take some time. And I, I have understand. to, I understand. I have to honor that. Um, there is a book I'm reading that a friend sent me. I'm like, some people are very intuitive. It's like a friend that I didn't know was that close. So and they crazy. just send you what you need kind yes, of thing. Yes, it's, I can't pronounce it. ho op opa ono we're going to get this by the end of the weekend. Yeah. (laughs) You'll get the written version of what I can't pronounce, but it's a beautiful book about a Hawaiian energetic uh, practice of forgiveness. And it's not only forgiving people. um, It's also a way to reconnect with newer versions of yourself and other people's self. I thought that was really interesting because I think something that happens is uh, let's just say it. Childhood traumas is a huge part of, of what happens in relationships you know, fast forward. And it, there's a, something that happens when the parent wants to keep the child like a three-year-old or a five-year-old and not acknowledge that they're their 10-year-old self, 15-year-old self. And that relationship needs to reform and rebond and be re-acknowledged. That style, from what I understand, because I'm still learning, is something that you can do. So there's that and forgiveness. And the most important thing is to forgive yourself. So there's something called a mirror work. First and foremost. First and foremost. And oh, I know yes. <laughs> both of us have shared with each other that that's extremely hard for us. We definitely it's 
so hard struggle with knowing that we made this choice to go into a relationship where we could get this hurt. And I know we're not the only ones, you know? So uh, there's something you do and you look in the mirror and say, I forgive you. I love you. You are traumatized, but you, it's okay that you went through this. This is part of your journey. And there's other things you can say. Everyone's obviously going to have a unique version of that, but like really looking at yourself in the eyes, in the face. And you said, you know, it was this time you looked at yourself in the mirror and I'll never forget. I was at Melly's house. Actually, I stayed there one of the nights I was homeless <laughs> and I, I'll never forget looking at myself in the mirror and being like, I'm back. <laughs> I'm not all the way back, <laughs> but I'm but getting I'm, there. I'm getting there. I'm yeah. like, dang, I'm, I'm pretty. Like yeah. <laughs> I look good. Cause I, there was so many times I got out of the shower and looked at myself in the mirror at that dark house and was just like, Ugh. Yeah, it's so it's so hard. And I don't think anybody will be able to exactly understand what that is unless they've been there. And if you have been there, I know you know exactly what this feeling's like of being able to not recognize yourself. And then the moment that you do, because I'll never forget the moment that I did either. It was actually with a friend of mine who was the first photographer I ever shot with, who's a friend of mine, Brian Phillips. He shot me when I was 21 and we reconnected to shoot again when I was starting to feel a little bit better. And I remember he showed me the camera and I saw a photo of myself and I was like, I almost cried. Oh. I was like, oh, I had goosebumps. I just, I just felt like, I was like, I literally was like, it's me. He's like, what do you mean? I'm like, it's, I'm like, I'm sorry. That sounded really weird, but I, I just see myself again. Mm -hmm. And I see myself for who I was years and years ago, not even before my relationship, but just who Christina was to her core. But like you said, it's an ongoing process and there's ups and downs. I mean, even recently I've had weeks where I've kind of, I don't want to say um, regressed, if that's the right word to use, but it, I don't know. It's not linear. No, healing is not like this straight shoot up, you know, it's, it's like, like a Disneyland ride like <laughs> when you go up and then you falter down. And you know, like I thought I was getting better and then I got sick and then I just tinked. There was a day where I, a couple of days where I literally couldn't get out of bed. And I was just like, but because of my awareness, I said, just observe Monica, just, just have grace, just observe, let yourself rest. You've been pushing it. You've been working really hard. You haven't really given yourself enough space. So if you don't take it, your body's going to take it. Yeah. And that's a lot of times what happens. And it's important for you all to stay observing in the phenomena that is the trauma that's going to hit your body yeah. so that you don't keep tanking and you don't think it's the end of the world because it's not. Right. And also, I know it's probably easier said than done, but stop ruminating on the fact of like what actually happened in your breakup to lead you there and just focusing on now the recovery and how you're healing because it's never, it's never about you. Mm -hmm. It really, it really isn't. I'm a, I'm a big believer in that, especially when it comes to traumatic things like this. And as much as we all want to take it on, especially if we're people like ourselves, we're like, oh my gosh, like, did I do enough? Mm -hmm. What could I have done better? But at the end of the day, some things are just out of your control. So the healing process really starts when you are able to let that part of it go and just focus on the healing and detachment. And that's not freaking easy. I mean, no. I, I say it like this, like, oh, just do this. And it's, that's not, I have done some like psychic healing and hypnotherapy. And I think that's helped a lot mm -hmm. as far as I have no desire to even like look at his, like his social media or something, which I was I'm kind of shocked about, but I have to say like, that was something that was really helpful. Cause he, and he kept saying, he kept giving me these examples of there's these like historical um, like fairy tales and stuff about the moment someone turns back to look at the past, they turn into stone. And so those moments can be little inklings of regression where we want to look back. And so, what, but I was lucky enough to have the support to move that energy away from me. And he just kept encouraging me like, I see, it's good, Monica. Like he's going to be tall, blue eyes. <laughs> broad shoulders keep going <laughs> like tell me more <laughs> what is like, who is no. this person? i don't really care what he looks like he was just kind of being silly with it <laughs> so, so funny, we'll though. see stay tuned yeah but um there's and then money wise you know my career there's so much good ahead this might have just been the one more thing that i truly had to deal with in this time frame of my life to to really learn what i needed to learn lesson wise as well as 
clarify what I wanted because the truth is every time I get out of a relationship, I'm like, I don't want that. Yeah. And you didn't see it during it. You're like, wow, was I settling for something that wasn't as fulfilling as I really wanted it to be, but I was making it work because I thought I should. It's so interesting because I've always like struggled to make that list of things that, because you don't, and well, I've like always been inti- like your, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking like for? Like the checklist of yeah. things that I want. Like your non-negotiables. Mm-hmm. But what I've learned, and it was funny because my girlfriend reminded me of this because I've shared this with her. I actually make my list about how I want him to make me feel. And the moment I started- I think you told me to do this. <laughs> I think I did too. And the moment I started um, not feeling those things, I told her and she goes, hey, remember the list? <laughs> like, Damn it. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> the list. You're like, but- but here, you, do you ever find yourself making up excuses for those things though? Because that's what I did in the past. Oh my because gosh. Because I come across like, let's say there was something on the, I, I don't even know what His to say. His life like, and circumstances or blah, whatever. Blah, blah. Yeah. And then something happens and it doesn't align with what I really want. And I'm like, well, it's okay because mm-hmm. uh, I kind of want to throw up. When I- <laughs> <laughs> well, the problem is I think it's important to remind ourselves that life is going to happen if your partner can't at minimum love and respect you as hard as it gets, it is not the fit. Yeah. And that's what I mean when it comes down. I'm not talking like small stuff. That's like you could toss to the wayside. I'm talking about like trust and respect, like the main building blocks for relationships. Like those are not things that you can fuck with Mm -hmm. and they shouldn't, you shouldn't have to keep making up excuses as to why someone cannot respect you as a human and you know have common decency in certain things and let i'll also be very clear there are mistakes that happen in relationships and people fuck up Mm -hmm. it's about you being able to get better and and communicate and express and and not do it again or be communicative about working through things that you're struggling with Mm -hmm. because you can everyone's going to struggle Mm -hmm. with, with different subjects and different things so And we also have to remember that everyone's experience is unique. Like this was very traumatizing to me. That person I ended things with, it could be just another relationship in his book. That's what's also interesting. And it's kind of maybe a hard pill to swallow a little bit. It is. But that's because that's that person's journey. And there, with that said, again, I'm going to bring up forgiveness. Eventually there comes a point, the healthiest thing you could do is forgive them and send them love because they arrived there from certain experiences and them continuing to act the way they act or cause whatever, like the pain that we caused unto others. It's not what we want. No, we want the butterfly effect of them healing a hundred treating people better. Cause it's usually not just the relationship they're treating their mother or their father themselves, themselves terribly. So with that said, as, as upset as we are, there's a sense of to work toward the forgiveness. So because that energy will carry and it might even hit them. You know, yeah. I believe in sending energy. And at the end of the day too, do you really want to carry around resentment for someone for the rest of your life? I know I don't because I've done that in the, when I, in my younger years and it was heavy and it didn't allow me to grow. And I wound up, I wound up forgiving this particular person in my past. Three years later, I actually had to sit down with them because I was like, I can't hold this anymore. I want to forgive you and move forward because I understand that you were hurt and this didn't, it wasn't about me. And Mm -hmm. I didn't, it felt so good. And that was a big lesson in my life. And it also made me realize that life will keep presenting you the same lessons you need to learn, whether they're, until you learn them, until you learn them, whether they're, whether they show up as a person or a situation until you learn them, it's going to keep showing up. So better just do the work now and practice being aware Mm -hmm. so you can heal. But I'm really happy to see you like the Monica I remember. (laughs) And I was so, I was so sad to know you were going through the, through that kind of experience, but I was happy to have you there for me too. And it's just so crazy. It's just so crazy how the world works. And I really do think that you were sent to me again to help me just how other people in your life have been there for you as well. And I just hope that there is so much, you know, good to come, which I know there will be. And I just want to touch on one last thing before we close this up, but for maybe somebody who is at our level of healing, 
How have you been dealing with maybe opening up yourself to something new or is this too soon for you? Or do you think that there's a time period where you just cannot move forward just yet? I do think it takes a little bit of time. However, uh, I do believe in kind of divine things happening and I have seen a little bit of that. So I don't want to be so closed off that you miss it, that you miss it. Yeah. That, However, that'd be so sad too. taking things slow and the priority being the healing and doing the things that we just talked about, having these types of conversations and accountability for, for something that you might, um, struggle with, you know, is so important. So accountability partners for sure. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Well, thank you so much for coming on here. This has been such a great experience, not only filming the first podcast of this series with someone besides myself. I think this is, this will be a great start into the journey of what fearless AF the podcast is supposed to mean. And I know I touched on it a little bit earlier, but just to remind you guys, the whole ideology behind what fearless was, was not to create this idea that you are going to go through life without fear because in reality, that is something that we naturally as humans are going to experience, but it's the idea that we can approach things with a fearless mentality and know that we can go through things and know that there's another side to it. And what was the other thing we touched on with that? That made so much sense. I'll have to go back and, and something you said earlier was like, I was like, damn, that's it. But, but yeah, I, I just want to bring on my, my own experiences and also people who have experienced these similar things along with me or who have aided me in becoming the person I am now to show you guys that there are resources and also people that you can learn from to help you get through painful and frightful experiences so you can see the other, the other side of them. So, And I think your experience started this whole, like really, like you had it in there. Obviously, this is your dharma to do this, but to actually start it, sometimes you got to have the rough one. <laughs> I know. And I don't, honest to God, I don't think this podcast would have actually ever came to life unless this actually happened. You know, I was taking a yoga class um, where I live here in Vegas and they were building a podcast studio here. And I was, th <laughs> I was thinking about it cause I was like, Oh man, I can't do this. That's so intimidating. I can't talk about this. And I was walking to the lockers and I saw it and I was like, man, if that wasn't divinity, Divine. I know. <laughs> so I was like, you know what, here I am. And maybe this is a step in my own healing as well. So I'm excited to be bringing more episodes to you guys for this. I will definitely link some of the free resources as well as links to both Melly and Monica. Um, Monica, who is here with me today, and Melly, who Monica shared with us earlier. And if you guys have any questions, please do not hesitate to reach out. We are here for you, and we will see you next time.